So uh, yeah, my name is Frederick Harper. I think I can still do my, my usual joke, no relation with who you are thinking right now. <laughs> At some point, I'm like with the new election, I won't be able to do that joke. That won't be funny anymore. I think I can still do it. So uh, yeah, I'm a technical evangelist. I don't go to church every Sunday. It's not what I'm doing. So my job is to talk to developer, talk to DevOps, talk to technical people, go to conferences, to user group, uh, give talk, but also network, help help developer being successful with different technologies. So right now uh, I'm at uh, Immunio, we're in the security space. So uh, my job is to talk to people about security. So not really do product pitch, but mostly trying to help developer to understand that security is important and uh, that you need to think a little more about security. So I used to do this uh, at Mozilla, at Microsoft, so depending, yeah, that sounds weird. Mozilla and Microsoft in the same sentence, but I was doing open source at Microsoft and doing HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Firefox OS at Mozilla. So uh, really connecting with people because it seems that I have a skill that many developers don't have. I'm social and I like to talk a little bit too much, so I found a job where they pay me to talk. Uh, feel free to uh, tweet during the presentation at the Farper, the good, the bad, the ugly thing. Share whatever you want. I just like this. Even if it's not positive, just share. I like it. And uh, you don't need to take notes or whatever. Uh, the slides will be online, uh, probably on my blog. I have the link at the end. And I'm also recording the presentation. So if there's something you did not catch or want to uh, share with your friend because that was so amazing, you're going to be able to do it. So uh, yeah, I'm really glad to be here. I think uh, when Martin was uh, the chief in common of that uh, user group, I think we tried like 10,000 times to uh, having me here and it never happened. I was supposed to be there last month, I found the issues, so I guess I just don't like Ruby people. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, joke aside, I'm really happy to be here. The talk is about 40 minutes, so feel free to ask questions during the talk, but you're gonna be stuck with me for like 45 minutes. So uh, there is beer, if it's too boring, you just go grab the beer, grab a slice of pizza, and that's it. So uh, today the talk is really uh, about Ruby and security. So that would be even better if I start my thing. So uh, first question for you, kind of a stupid question, but still I have to ask. Is security something important for you? Like raise your hand if it is. Is there people that think that security is not important for them? Raise your hand. Usually there is always like one Funny people I say, oh, I know it's not funny. But most of the time, when you really ask that, qu that question more uh, seriously, nobody will tell you, like, no, security is not important for us. Like, everybody care about security. Everybody know that it's important. But how many developers in the room, like, just to have an idea, like, are you all developers, or there's some DevOps, or some, like, other stuff you do? No? Yes? Or sleeping? Long day? <laughs> it's already that boring? No? All devs? Okay. So, uh, I don't know for you, but before being an evangelist, I was a developer. I still consider myself a developer, but I was a developer full time. And I never thought about security. Maybe I was a bad developer, but I never really took the time to learn more about like different security threats or uh, how can I do like better coding to be sure that my application is going to be more secure. So I don't know for you, but I didn't really have the time to think that much about security. And I didn't have the expertise. Is there any security expert in the room? Because I may need help during my presentation. No? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have the expertise. And uh, the more I'm learning about security, the more I find that it's it's quite complicated because there is so many ways that people can attack you. There's so many ways uh, that you think you can create something that is secure, but at the end of the day, it's not. But you don't know it because you don't know it. That's good. So, uh, or, or do you have the money? There is security expert out there that you can pay, and they're going to come to uh, your company, or they're going to do a no audit on your uh, software and your application, and they're going to tell you, hey, there is an issue there and there. There are some people that are doing this for a living, like pen tester, penetration tester. They do this all day long. They try to find flaw in your application. But like any expert, they cost money. And under case, it's specific about security. 
And let's be honest, like most of the time, even if you think about security in your development process, it's most of the time an afterthought. You're going to do the basic stuff. You're going to have login, password. You're not going to store a clear password in the database. You may say, oh, hey, let's put HTTPS everywhere. And that's basically going to be it most of the time. Or I was really a bad developer because I, it, this is basically what I was doing. Uh, and and I, did, I never had personally any security issue with the software that I developed. But it doesn't mean that uh, at some point I won't have any. Or maybe it happened and I didn't even know. So my question tonight for you is, are you sure that your applications, the one that are out there, the one that customers are using, the one that you deploy to one of your uh, client, the one that you are using, the one that you created for fun, or just like something you publish online that people can log in, people have access to different information, people submit different information to your application. Are you sure that those applications are really secure? Thanks for the people that were honest in the room and that say, no. Because if, if everybody was saying yes, I was like, okay, I'm done. Let's go to Benelux and uh, have beer. And even for those of you that are a little bit arrogant and say, yes, my application is totally secure. What about those beautiful legacy applications? You know, those applications that are running, you have no idea how, how it's running. And you don't want to touch the code because this is like spaghetti code and, and it's someone that did this like years ago. It's working. It may be crucial for your uh, company, but you don't want to touch it. It's working. You don't want to update libraries. You don't want to update anything. It's just working. You don't have time. You don't have money. Those applications, there's a lot of security vulner vulnerabilities in those applications. Yes? Mm -hmm. There is a lot of those applications, and most of the time, the company that can have those experts that do this, it's, it's usually either like really huge company or company where security cannot be an issue like bank or like all those types of applications. But it's not because we're not, we're not creating software for banks that we should not care about security. So, yes, I know it's a WordPress logo and a Ruby user group, but bear with me. So uh, it's a slice of life. Uh, yes? The what? Yes. <laughs> so I had, I still have my uh, WordPress uh, blog. Yes, PHP. And at some point my blog was like super slow. I say, it's not popular, like there's not a lot of people going there, and like I don't think it's a server issue. I was like, it's super slow, so it's WordPress. Like WordPress is getting bloated, like it's getting big and big, and it's PHP, or maybe it's the plugins, like I'm using 10,000 plugins because I'm just too lazy to go in the code, it's just more easy to install a plugin. I was trying to find what happened, I was like, is, is there because I have to do blog posts, I need to clean the database, I was looking and looking and looking, and somewhere I went to the log, I was like, oh, People were doing brute force attack on my blog all the time. And brute force attack is just people trying to log in with like usual suspect in, in, in like username, password, and they try and they try and they try. And usually it's not like someone behind a computer, it's an automatic like system, it's a bot that tried to log into your website. And in that case, that was like handmin, handmin, handmin love, handmin nature, handmin like, you know, all the, 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 the usual suspect when it comes to password and username. They were trying my first name, my last name, a combination of both. And they were attacking me so much that my site was slowing down. Fortunately for me, I'm not making money with that site. Uh, it would be bad if my site would be online or be hacked, but uh, I was like, okay, I need to figure out why it's happening. So I saw this because my site was slow, but if they were not attacking me that much, like just half of the effort they put on my site, I would never know that it would ha uh, attacking my site. And what you need to think in mind is that right now, your application may be attacked. There's maybe someone who is attacking your website right now, you don't know it because either they're not successful or if they're successful, they do something really uh, minimal. Uh, it happened to me on some website where uh, the, 
it was not minimal, but it just took the front page and say, haha, we hacked you. I had nothing better to do in my night. So I just went to your server and hacked your, your web page. Or at some point, some people were using uh, the space on my host to, uh, like, when I logged into my FTP server, I saw that I had, like, a folder. That, like, what is that folder? And with a lot of illegal stuff. And they were just using my space and my bandwidth to share stuff with other people in the world. But I didn't know. Like, I know this because I logged in into my FTP and I saw that folder. But I did not know that they were successors. I had no idea when they did this and when they started to use my space. So the goal is not to afraid you. It's not to make everybody pariah. But think about that site that nobody created an account on it, the room, sure. <laughs> so Madison, it happened not too long ago. And uh, I don't remember exactly the, the, the security issue they had, but the uh, what happened is that all the members of that site went public with information about like name and first name and some address, credit card number. But I don't know for you, but it's a kind of website where you don't want to see the user out there public. So that was terrible for two things. First, the website is still available. You can still go create an account trying to cheat on your wife and your husband. We can talk about this is a different discussion. You need to do this even if it's moral or no. You can still do this, but unless you, let, you live under a rock for the last couple of weeks or months, and if you want to cheat, there's no way you're going to go on that website. You got hacked. There's an issue, but that was more terrible than that. It's more about the, it's less about the data in that case. There's some people that just committed suicide because their name was all there. Again, we can talk about like the fact that they subscribed there, they wanted to cheat. It's another discussion. But there is real impact in life. And what happened to those developers that are there? They may not have a job anymore because they don't get enough money now to pay and the company is probably closing or maybe they're switching to something else under another name or I don't know. But there is a lot of issues when it comes to security that we don't think about. And those people, they realize those issues once it happened. And it was too late. So, super long intro, just to say, Tonight, my goal is not to make you a security expert, because guess what? I'm not even a security expert. So that's going to be quite interesting for a talk on security with someone who is not an expert about security. But my goal is really to make you understand that, uh, not to make you understand, everybody knows that security is important, but make you understand really that you need to think more about security when you create your application. You need to put in your development life cycle, the security, you need to have a bucket, you need to take time, you need to take part of the budget to think about security. So, again, I'm not a security expert. So my approach, my approach tonight is, as a developer, as I told you, I was a developer, I known that security was important, but I didn't really have any tools or knowledge to make my application more secure. So my presentation tonight is really about, hey, as a developer, you don't have that expertise in security, how can I know a little more about security? How, what, what are the like faster, I don't like to say fast because usually we say fast or quick, it means that, that it won't be effective, but that can also be effective. That can be great things, but I don't want you to spend hours and hours doing security stuff. I just want you to go find the small tricks. And funny enough, I'm not even a Ruby expert, so I know Ruby, I started Ruby not too long ago, and uh, I'm probably gonna bug Martin so much real, uh, really soon, so be prepared. Uh, so my talk is yes around Ruby, mostly on Rails, sorry for other people that use other framework, but yeah, Ruby, that's right. So, uh, uh, but you can basically use most of the trick for any other type of programming language. Do you know where that quote is coming from? Oh, come on, John. What? Hackers. Yes. You need to watch that movie. It's a whole one. It's really, really nice. There's, uh, yeah, it's. I, I really like that movie. So that was my uh, fanboy time. So uh, before starting to make your application more secure, let's understand how your application can be attacked or how your application can be uh, vulnerable. So if you go on GitHub, you don't see there, but uh, there is OWASP. Uh, that is a nonprofit organization that tried to make the web more secure. Uh, they have a project made, made in uh, Ruby on Rails called Rails Goat. Uh, this is a project that has security issues 
they made it to have some security issues so you can try it you can test it there is a tutorial i'm going to use it for some example but this is really great if you want to go in the code see how it's working see how they made those issues and they really have tutorials to show you how it's working so obviously in four to five minutes i i, I won't be able to talk to you about all the type of uh issues or, or like vulner vulnerabilities that uh, your application can have. So I'm going to stay stick to the top three. Uh, the OWASP that I was talking before, uh, every two or three years, they're uh, creating a report about the top ten uh, issues, security issues, and those three are in the top three since forever. So the people that are smiling, either I have something in my beard or you just read the uh, XKCD comic. So for those of you that don't know XKCD, uh, you need to go check SKCD after the event because this is usually always amazing. And this one uh, introduces you to uh, SQL injection. So SQL injection is the most, I would say, dangerous one because this one can play directly with your data. So basically, you give an access to uh, the intruder, to the attacker, to the hacker, to the cracker, name it as you want, to the bad guy, to modify your SQL statement, your SQL queries. And it's not really about having access to the database directly. Most of the times, it's about your application. So that's going to give me either the, uh, the possibility to get more data, more data that I should update, more data that you would give me the permission, or even delete some stuff. So what about if I'm using your application, and I should be able to get the data from 10 employees in the company, but by modifying the SQL statement, I'm able to have access to all the employees or all the information, like private information, like phone number, address. And this is really more, uh, this is something we see a lot more often than we talk. So let me show you one example where I'm gonna be able to access that website. This one you see, uh, this one. So uh, let's be honest, I'm a little bit cheating with this one. I have an example in Ruby, but it sucks. This one is really amazing, it's in Java, but it can still do the same thing in Ruby. So. I have that application where I need to log with username and password, like any application. And I don't remember the username and password, so I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna go there. Uh, this is the username, but uh, I think that like, my password is, is uh, trader. So I try to log in and say, ah, no, wrong password. So that can be either my, my account and I just forgot about my password, or that can be like I saw, I saw Safie right next to me and she logged in and I saw the email. I didn't see the password, but I saw the email because it's not obfuscated, it's not, uh, it's not hidden. So I said, okay, no, I got, I got one username. There's probably a way to try to connect and that won't work with all websites. But my first guess would be, okay, let's try to see what's gonna happen if I had, uh, no, you won't see it, but if I had a simple quote. So I'm gonna type trader with a simple quote just to see how the application's gonna handle this. So if I try to log in, in that case, I get an error. So for me, this is the first cue. I say, oh my God, like I put a sample quote and now it's not like wrong password. It's no, I got an issue directly with the application 500. So that means that there is an issue in the code. So, oh, that means that that application took the sample quote that I put. Let's, let's try something again. Let's try the same thing, password. I don't care which password. I'm gonna put two times sample quote. Is this big enough? Or you just listen to me, you don't have to. Do you want to see the sample quote? Yeah. <laughs> what is the, there we go. So I'm gonna try to log in. I put two sample quotes and no errors. So it was not like just a sample quote. It's, it's really, I open something, I open a string, and I close the string. I say, okay, maybe there's something there. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try again, trader. I'm gonna close the password. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you after what I'm doing. So what I did there, I said, okay, I, I still think the password is trader, but at the end of the day, it doesn't care. So uh, what happened in that application right now, for those of you that know uh, SQL, no matter the where clause, where close you have, if you put or one equal one, it's true. So no matter what you have before or after, <laughs> but unless you have like n and, and there is like parentheses or those kind of things, but in that case, I'm checking the username password. 
and I'm gonna say okay and uh, yeah kind of like don't care about the password and or one on one and I put number sign to like create a comment so like forget what's after and you don't see it but I was able to log in without having the real password and usually people are like ah, ooh, ah. no okay <laughs> the first time I tried this I was like what and now you're gonna tell me like okay those people created an application with that issue don't start to try to do this with every website. Most of the time that won't work. But it's not just about that password field. It's about mostly any field that you have in an application where you take the user input and you take that input to do a query to the database. So what happened in that case, it's in the code, the developer just tried to, you tried to create a string, a SQL query in a string, and it just took like the input from the user. Why well, I should I should care? I, I should trust the user. Like you just gave me the username and password. But what happened is because I created this string and I just had that query or one equal one, that means that my query was true. So the password didn't matter at some point. So I, I just logged in with the user without knowing the password. And you're gonna be able to do this in a couple of type of application. There is some more complex way to do kind of SQL injection. I won't do the example uh, completely because that can take a little more time. So we have to start this by. So what's frightening with the security space is that it's super easy to become a hacker. Not maybe a really good hacker, but like there is a lot of tutorials out there. There is a lot of tools. Bird Suite is probably one of the most known, as far as I know, tool for hackers. Uh, I got the free edition, so I didn't have to pay for this. And it's like, hey, I have a tool where I can use it to do a couple of things. So in my case, I'm gonna use it to uh, use it as a proxy. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna go in my network settings, connect it on Wi-Fi, gonna activate the proxy. So what I'm doing right now is that every connection that's gonna happen on my computer. They're gonna go through that application, verb application. So what that's gonna give me, that's gonna give me the opportunity to, let me start Bell's Goat. That's gonna give me the opportunity to listen to every call arriving to the application, but also leaving the application. So every inbound and outbound. So I'm gonna start the Rails Goat using the Rails server. Should be there, I refresh, it's good. Intersection. Let's put this off. So let me log with the username I have. So this is Rails Goat, uh, super beautiful UI. So as an example, if I go in account setting, they usually usually a page you you have, like it's uh, email, first name, last name, and you can change your password. So now what I did, I activated the proxy. So everything, as I said, every connection going to my uh, browser right now, it's gonna go through uh, Bird because in the option, I listen to uh, the port 8080 and in my network connection that I activated before I'm listening to that port. So every connection will go through this and that application is gonna intercept and stop all my calls. So if I try and I go, I say, okay, I want to change my password. It was one, two, three, four, five, six, like super secure password. I'm gonna click submit. This guy will intercept the call. And what I can do, I can go there and can say, okay, let's change request method. And what you can see right now, it's the information that went through my application through my server. In that case, it's on my computer, but that would be the same kind of thing. If I go there, I have the username, and the password, so if I really want to try to find an issue in that application, I can go there, I can say, okay, let's modify, and uh, okay, let's change the password there, but I can say, okay, no, I'm not gonna target uh, the user Harper, oh, where, where's the uh, user? I'm not gonna target the user ID six. I can remove that parameter. And, yeah, yeah. I can remove that parameter. So when I'm gonna send back that, let me remove the, if I forward 
uh, that call. That call is going to go on the server. So I was able to intercept the call through the server and modify it. And in my case, what I would like to do, but I won't do it tonight, is to say instead of changing the password for just my username, let's change the password for all usernames, like handman usernames and any other usernames. So this is another way to do a SQL injection. So I did not modify the form. I did not attack anything. I did not use the text box. But I intercept the call. I modify it. And this is what my server received. And it doesn't matter if my server is here or out there. In that case, it's because the developer uh, they went through a, a get process, so I had access to the information. They did not use HTTPS. So there is a couple of things that they should have done. But People that know those things, they do it. But when you don't do it, like it's there, it's clear for me. And again, I'm not an expert. I just, it's when I was saying that it was so easy, I learned that thing by uh, checking on a YouTube video and talking with someone at a job. But when I was looking on something on YouTube, the guy was showing me how to do this. He had a voice of like a six years old. So I was like, there's kids, they can go out there, they read the tutorials, they create and they become hackers. Because it's just cool to be able to go on a website and change something and change some, some text. So all the tools, they're available there. So imagine if a six years old can do this, what we can do like when we know technology just a little bit. So SQL injection is quite frightening because that gives really access to your data. That gives you, that gives access to people to your database. Either to, as I said, select, update, or delete, uh, delete some stuff. The second one that is uh, one of the most popular two and quite interesting is uh, XSS or cross-site scripting. So basically that give uh, the attacker the possibility to run some uh, JavaScript code in your customer's browser. And there is different ways to do this and sometimes that won't be something really terrible. Like the example that gonna, I'm gonna show you, uh, if that happened to you, it's just really, really annoying. But uh, you won't like uh, have any big security issues, but that's going to prove a point that I am able to run JavaScript in the browser. But by doing this, I'm going to be able to either get access to some like user session. I'm going to be able to get uh, get access to some uh, users' information. I'm going to be able to redirect people to uh, a, a scam website or a website that is not uh, the website that I think I'm on. You know, when we when you uh, you have this with some link that looks like the original link, but you just mistyped something. Uh, Sometimes you can try the right website, and because there is some JavaScript inside, uh, malicious JavaScript, you're going to be able to be redirect some place. But I don't know for you, maybe it's just because when you go to some special website, but at some point you can have injection in your browser, and all websites, even the, the more legit one, the, more, uh, the one that you should not expect to have issues, they're going to have JavaScript pop-up, or they're going to have like, uh, like ads link inside a website. But in reality, it's not happening on the server. It's not the server that delivers you bad website with some spam in it. It's really on your browser. You got uh, an XSS attack, a JavaScript, uh, cross-site scripting. So if I go back to Rails Goat, if I go back to Rails Goat, uh, I can create an account. Can I? Oh. I'm still stopping everything. Let me go remove the proxy. No, nobody's watching you. That's okay, I just said if it was boring, go take a beer, so you, you did it. It's a joke. It's a so, I can use sign up page. Uh, I'm going to say, OK, let's create a user. This is my email. Uh, but instead of my first name, I'm going to put some uh, JavaScript. This is an alert box. It's just annoying. It's not the most terrible thing that's going to happen to you. And Harper, and I'm going to create again. I don't know why. I just like one, two, three, four, five, six. It's just easier when you do a demo. So I'm creating a user form that you probably created in all your application when you have uh, users access. And for some reason, it did not work. So let me try this again. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm put the, the demo guide. There we go. 
So as you can see on that corner, it's supposed to be welcome my first name. But every time the application is going to try to display my first name, I'm going to have that super annoying pop-up. Again, nobody will like have your credit card credit cards to uh, oh my God, credit card stolen because uh, you put an alert box. But that means that I was able to in insert basically in your database some JavaScript. So every time you display my name, there's that annoying pop-up. So that means that your application, I was able to inject some JavaScript. So I may be able to do some more bad thing, I would say, inside the application. And it was super easy for me because like, ooh, check if the first name contained JavaScript. You expect your user to be a, like correctly and say, no, that's going to be first name. Worst case, you're going to have French character and nobody in 2015 understand UTF-8, but this is a different <laughs> story. Uh, but still, like, who's going to think about like, oh, I need to escape in case someone puts some JavaScript in the first name. But this is the issue. So right now, that means that on that website, I am able to run some JavaScript. And that doesn't seem so frightening right now, but that really means that I can have access to different other things. I may be able to check cookies. I may be able to check session ID. I may be able to just redirect people to different places. So this is the second most common attack out there. So it's related to JavaScript. So for those of you that doesn't like JavaScript, it's like a good thing. Yeah, yeah, there is an issue with JavaScript. You shouldn't use it. It's bad. But um, <laughs> like, it's still good. Uh, the third one, uh, I'm just going to give you, uh, show you what it is. I'm not going to do demo. But uh, it's remote command execution. And now you're going to tell me, yeah, I'm not using like eval in my code, or not. I'm not accessing anything that I can run like in the command line. Maybe you, won't, you don't do this. But it's the third most common type of attack. So there is a lot of people that are doing it. So everything in your application that you're trying to use some shell command, Everything, every time that you're going to try to eval evaluate something, like use the eval function, you're going to give potentially access to the uh, command shell on your server. And that means that if I can have access to the common shell, I may, that's going to depend on your configuration, but I may be able to have access to anything else. I may be able to run a Trojan horse that's going to open the door for me, open some port. And after I'm going to have like free access, there's going to be free meal, free food for me. Yes? What if you don't use the shell? What if you use that as a user for the attack? You're going to be in the sandbox. So if there is any type of image that I can do to your application or your server, that's going to be used in your thing. So uh, there is way less chance that that could happen. How might it still happen if you compromise the like function that you're trying to use for the application that you're using? That's the, most of the time uh, when that happens, it's really because you don't standardize the information coming from the user. So I may be able to uh, return, I don't know, the password you use to have access to uh, certain comment. I may be able to, sometimes it's less about having access than finding information. I may be able to find, okay, where is the execute table that we're running? Okay, it's an home slash that user slash, okay, okay, I know that there is files there. And after this, I may want to do uh, what you call excessive 400, so I'm gonna try to call many type of URL that I'm expecting to have you on your server. And depending on the return of the server, I'm gonna know if they exist or if they don't exist, so that can give me a, a, an idea of where I may want to attack. Or so that, that may happen that there is some, uh, I saw so many websites where to go on the admin page, you need to enter username and password. But if you access admin a soft folder in the admin directly, they don't have to do for admin because like there is no security on the folder. And that happened more often than in team. So it's, all, it's, it's not always the big attack, but it's also what is crucial, and, and uh, again, I'm not a security expert. We have uh, a couple at, at work, but there is one in Montreal. It's one of the, the, the best pen tester that you've seen. He didn't say it. My boss told me. Uh, one of the best pen tester in North America, and, and this guy told me, like, it's, it's the information we can get. Every small piece of information can lead to a potential bigger attack. Uh, there is, like, uh, is it 
CSERT tempering, or there is one type of attack where once you get a username password, you're going to log in, log out, log in, log out, log in, log out. And you're going to check every time the information generated for your session ID or, or what you're going to put on co the cookie on, uh, on the, uh, the computer. And by doing this, you're going to be able at some point to find a pattern and use that pattern to create your own username password and have access to different part of the software. So it's always whole bits of information that you can get if you really want to go through. Like it's not something like, oh, I have two hours to lose before going to have beer with my friends. So I'm going to try to hack your website and find the small piece of information. But if you want to really want to go through, so I would say, unless you really need to use like something on your server that is not part of your application, execute some, some third party application or whatever, try to don't use it. And then if you use it in a kind of sandbox, but it's really, I know that there is some situation that you don't have the choice. Make sense? Super long answer for a small question, but uh, I talk a lot. So those were the three top, but there's a lot more. Brute force is one really common, like it's because you just need to start a boat and it's like the Google crawler to just go to the web and trying to find some website and some IP and, and you're going to see that happen quite often with like WordPress or Drupal because they're like super popular and they know where are the bugs or they know when to enter, but there is a lot of type of other attacks. So even if you're an expert, there's no way for you to know everything. So this one is coming from? Okay, athletes, athletes, no answer. So um, there are some tricks. So there is one rule. I think I was really in the movie, like mindset when I did that, uh, those slides. But uh, my first rule, and it's really not from me, I stole it from someone, but I, I, I like to say that it's from me. Uh, anything from the user is not safe. If you respect that rule, and it's totally not scientific what I'm gonna say, but I'm pretty sure you're gonna fix 95% of potential issues that you can have with your application. Uh, anything from the user is unsafe. That means, uh, no string attached. Oh, that was funny when I wrote it. But, uh, so don't, don't use, don't try to do your query uh, using uh, string because uh, I'm gonna be able to do what I did before, logged in. So use, uh, most of you use rails, I presume. So uh, there's active record that's gonna give you uh, the opportunity to do, to do your query uh, by using either uh, some hash or some hash. So in that case, if I look at the first sentence, uh, the first line of code, I can basically just add an or one equal one because uh, you're gonna take the uh, param password or even at the name, I can do this. And, and you won't have, there is no way for you to control this by doing, by creating a string where you do your SQL statements. But if I go to the second one, you're still gonna use what I'm gonna be able to inject. But in that case, that's gonna be part of the, uh, the data that's gonna be sent at SQL. So that's not gonna be part of the SQL statement. So if I had an or one equal one, that's gonna be part of my password. So the only thing I'm gonna have is a uh, right, wrong password. You cannot log in. So those really small strip, uh, strip, but it really worth it. Like it's basic stuff, but you should do this in all your application. No more like a uh, SQL uh, statement using string. And uh, better, you can even use uh, stored prop uh, if you're using, depending on the database you're using. So try to have a second level of verification right inside your uh, database. I don't want to start a fight about if you should use ORM or no, but uh, there are some advantages because they're most of the time they're doing the checkup for you. So if you use uh, an ORM, and there is some of there, uh, the most popular as far as I know is SQL, uh, but there is some other uh, that are free, there are on GitHub. Uh, there are some paid one, but I think most of them in Ruby, and, and let me know if I'm wrong, but uh, they're we're not updated since forever. So uh, I think SQL does a trick. If you want to, if you want to get, get a kind of abstraction between your application and uh, the model of data that you're using in your database, but by using those, there are some pro and cons, but uh, there's a security aspect that uh, come into the game. There's something called uh, whitelisting. So I think part of Ruby, you had at some point some blacklisting and it was working so-so because uh, the blacklisting was like, hey, I don't uh, want to have uh, the script tag, but a hacker would be able to inject script script and, and 
like, yeah, that was shitty as an example, but yeah, the blacklist was not the best approach. Uh, there's something called the whitelist, and uh, there's a great framework. It's, it's free, it's on GitHub, called uh, Sanitize, and basically what that framework do for you is sanitize uh, the input in your HTML or even in your CSS, and it's really easy to use. So the first line of code here is really uh, like how, what I would do to sanitize would be a configuration relax. So like don't go crazy, try to uh, avoid everything that could hurt my application, but uh, let some stuff go. So if you check that example, if I have that input from the user, and at first it seems legit, like there is bold, and there is, again, my super really frightening alert box. If I use that, uh, that, that, that library, what's gonna happen is that now I put in relax mode, you're gonna remove the script. So if I use that input to do whatever, you're still gonna see in text alert, but that's not gonna be, uh, that's not, the browser's not gonna be, it's not gonna go into interpret, uh, interpret that code. But I can also use it in default mode, and it's like the strong uh, fighter of that uh, library. So if I do this one, it's gonna remove everything that is HTML, every time, every type of uh, HTML elements, you're gonna remove that. So you're gonna, Start with this one, and you're gonna get only food. So this one, this library, really easy to use. Uh, kind of lightweight, doesn't have overweight, uh, not overweight, but a uh, overhead. And uh, at the end of the day, you don't want you don't want to satanize like every code you create. You want to satanize what is coming from, uh, sanitize what's coming from the user. There is another type of sanitization library, Mofis a kind of popular HTML filter, uh, like use Google, you're gonna find a ton of them, use GitHub, some are more, pop more popular, less popular. I really like the previous one, uh, Sanitize, because it's really well maintained, and it's working well, and it's updated quite often. One of the other things that we don't think about, what we think most of the time is that we use ton of gem, and it's crazy, I don't know if it's me that is like, really uh, a whole part, I don't know, but I use just the gem that I need, but when I go to Akaton and I'm working with like the kids and they're like, just to try to help them to debug, I have to install like 20 gems. And I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, we're just displaying LOL well right now. It's like, why do you need like those 20 gems? But still, we are living in a world where we cannot use JavaScript, we can use jQuery, so we do the same thing with every programming language. So what you can do is, you don't really want to always update your gem because you may have like compatibility issues, you may miss some stuff uh, that was working in previous version. But what you want to be sure at least to do is to be sure that the gem version that you're using don't have any big security issue. So, uh, I never remember the name. So there is bundle audit, uh, it's available again on GitHub, it's free. Uh, what is great is that uh, remember the name of the, yeah, so on uh, Ruby Sec, Bundle Audit is the tool I'm gonna show you, it's free, but there is also uh, Ruby Hadvisory DB, and this is a database on GitHub, so this is like a JSON file, with all the uh, security vulnerabilities on Ruby and also on Rails, so everything they are detected, and on different gem also. So that tool used that database, so let me update because I don't know if I updated recently. So you update the database, it basically fetch the second uh, GitHub repository. And after all my projects, so I'm still on my uh, Rails Goat here. Uh, this is like my uh, my application. Actually, the zoom is not that good. It's my application. So application, like you know, there's nothing suspicious there. And if I run bundle audit really quickly. The only thing you're gonna do is super simple. You can do this manually, but you don't want to lose time. There is a tool there, it's free, uh, it's working well. So what happened now is that I run that application on uh, my folder. You need to use bundle. So you need to have a gem file. It's working with the gem file. So that's gonna check in the gem file, which version of different gems that I'm using. I'm gonna say, hey, okay, the, uh, this gem, like no code you read. Uh, yeah, there is uh, an issue, particularly on Node. But what you can do, you can use the Hadley survey. If you don't have it, the high there, you can use the Hadley survey. Just search this on Google. This is a unique ID for different type of like security issue. 
And the solution, that case, and all cases is simple because most of those issues here have been fixed. So say, okay, now I need to update to that version. Basic stuff. But again, most of the time we have gem that we don't update because uh, that may create issue inside your application. But when there is security vulnerabilities, take the time to update at least those one. You use bundle ODET, easy to work well. That gives you a good approach from your application. There is other ODET tool that you don't have to run manually. Some of them, they also do static code analysis. Uh, Hap Canary uh, seems that it's a good one. I didn't uh, use it that much. Uh, there is Haikiri and uh, so there is other tools. There is more services. Uh, they have some feeds here. So uh, some of them you can use on one project. Or if your project are public on GitHub, you're good to go. But if you have private project, you won't be able to use it or you need to pay. But there is a lot of those uh, services out there. So use them. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do tonight. It's like use the things that doesn't take you much time, that doesn't cost you that much, that can do part of the job for you. Because you don't, we don't have time to do all those security stuff. And there is some basic stuff. Like I was talking, I was joking about password before, but uh, even if you use like MD Fire, any, any type of like basic hash, your password is kind of like secure in the database, but it's so easy to, uh, yeah, so I uh, said so no. So it's so easy to decrypt. So use things like uh, PBKDF2. Uh, it's available in most programming language, uh, Ruby or not, and, and usually uh, that's, not going to be 100% secure. Nothing is 100% uh, secure. But that's going to be a lot harder to decrypt your password. I was talking about evils. Try to avoid using evil. Uh, if you can use Tor proc, uh, those are like basic stuff. And most of the time I have that slide and I see people in the room say, hey, thanks for, for making losing me like five seconds of my life that I can never take back. But if they are on the slide, it's because there are people that are not doing it. Not you. But there's other people somewhere that are not using those things. Think about HTTPS, think about firewalls, they're shit to configure, but if you're good enough to do it, if you have a good DevOps team or, or, or IT guy, and they're gonna do a great job, uh, that's gonna be a great tool for you. Try to learn how to be a hacker, not, not like going to your bank and trying to, uh, because you're just gonna go in jail. It's not a good idea, but at least understand how a hacker can trick you or can trick your application and I told you, there is a lot of tutorials out there. There's a lot of videos. Uh, there is code bashing that I really like. Uh, it's not free access for all. Like, they still don't have a sign up page and whatever. It's kind of new. But they have a lot of great tutorials. And it, what is great is that it's step by step. Like, hey, what is a SQL injection? Go on the page that I show you. And they're going to explain you step by step what I just did before with the uh, login without a password. And they're gonna explain you why. They're gonna show you the answer from the server and what they're sending to the server. So you're gonna be able to understand how it's working. And the idea is not to become hacker. The idea is to understand, hey, how an hacker can do a SQL injection in my application. If I know this, I may be able to think about it when I'm gonna create my code, when I'm gonna create my application. Try to stay informed. Uh, but the thing is that it's so complicated. I was talking about cross-site scripting. OWASP is probably, it's not probably, it's one of the best places to get information about security. But this is their page about things that you need to know, a cheat sheet about XSS. So right now, after this, you go back to your project and say, I want to be sure that nobody is going to be able to do cross-site scripting. need to learn how this. You want to do this? Thanks. I said that someone was really, yeah, I want to do this. I have no life. So um, there is, it, this is just about XSS. And this is probably one of the most complete page cheat sheet about like what you need to understand to try to prevent XSS, the tips and tricks. But it's one thing. There's no way for us to know all those things. So. I show you uh, the gem analysis. There's also static code analysis. Again, you're not having to change all your mindset. <laughs> there is one free that is pretty good for uh, Ruby called Breakman. Again, it's on GitHub, it's free. If I go, if I know I to type clear, and I go still, I'm still in Railgo, and I use Breakman, 
Breakman's gonna analyze my code and uh, from the name, it's, just, it, it's a static code analysis, so that's not gonna detect an issue you can have on a runtime. But if I go there and I use that beautiful zoom, I can see where he found some issue. The interface is really it's basic stuff like, hey, I found information, I give you the information, but you're gonna be able to, to know that, hey, in, uh, I don't know, if I scroll, scroll down and I say, okay, controller, I have a warning there, in application controller, oh, there is possibly a cross-site request for the issue. And he told me which function, and usually told me uh, near which line. Like you can see here, I'm gonna know, okay, in that place, I can have a common injection. And if I go, let me zoom out, it's gonna be easier for me. Uh, yeah, it's there, yeah, insufficient validation for email. So if I go on model user, and which line? I know that here, and I may not know why right now, and it's not a big thing, you need to search, you need to understand why there may be an issue there, but for that application, there is a security, a possible security issue there, because you're not validating, you're not doing a great validation of the email. That means that, hey, I may be able to, uh, because there is no beginning and, and ending, and I'm not dealing with character, different characters, so I may be able to insert more information and do potentially a SQL injection in that code. But it's not something you, you, you you're just validating, hey, there is a, a, a dot something, and there is the, the hat sign, this is an email. Good enough, this is what I wanted to know for my application. So static code analysis, this is one really good for free. Uh, of course, there is paid one. There's a lot of those. Uh, those are the three, I think, most popular. I would say code climate, probably a lot of people use it or know it. Uh, there's a good hookup with, with GitHub. Uh, code review, downscanner, it's another one, another free one. Uh, code climate is free, I think, for one uh, project on GitHub if it's public. Uh, I know that a lot of DevOps are people that li like to have like uh, automatic deployment, they use code climate because it's more than security, it's about best practices when it comes to developing software, so it's not just about security. But again, static code analysis, there's some free, some paid one, there is some, some that you can just put in your deployment process and don't have to worry about. They're gonna give you a green or a yellow or a red line, uh, light, and it's like, hey, you need to fix something, or everything is good, you can deploy in production. So it's something not complicated to use, but it's something that's going to save time. And there is something quite new, and uh, it's called RASP. So it's runtime application self-protection. Static code analysis, they're pretty good to, anal uh, to, to an analyze static code. The thing is that static code doesn't equal all the time what you're doing in production. When your application is running, there's probably some stuff that, there's a lot of stuff actually, the, uh, the static code analysis cannot detect. So. Uh, there's not a lot of product out there. This is what we do at Immunio. I don't want to do a demo or whatever. I'm not there to like pitch Immunio. I'm just telling you that those product, it's quite easy to install depending on the type of product. Uh, if I go there and I do, I can just have in a uh, gem file, in my case, Immunio, because I'm working for those guys. And I think we have a KCAS product. And if I, Bundle of install. I'm gonna install the uh, gem. And basically, I'm just gonna have like to configure uh, the gem to know which application uh, I'm protecting. So in my case, go in the dashboard, logged in. Woo. I really need one password because I have no idea what is my password. Simple. Oh. That is stupid.
So if I go there, I create an application. So what I'm going to need is the key and the secret to link my Rails Go to Munio in that case. So I'm going to do bundle. Don't remember the syntax in it. Sorry? Oh. <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> so basically, I'm just having to put. Whoa, it's really not that. Hmm? Oh! Saffron. <laughs> Wait! Windows. So you're saying that the only thing you're learning today is that you can use Bando? I used to like you. I think it's done. Yeah, you need to. So I'm linking, it's just creating a configuration file, and if I uh, still run my my application Rails Go, I'm going to be protected with a RASP because the gem that I install, there is an agent in it doing detection about different type of threat, but also doing the protection depending on the configuration. So if I go back in Rails Go and I try to do an XSS attack, like Immunio is going to be able to detect it, but also protect it. But I don't want to go too far with uh, Munio. So it's another type of tool. And there is not a lot out there when it comes to uh, real-time security. What I can tell you, it's, uh, it's only, we only scratched the surface. And, and this is kind of like part one of this type of presentation. So this one was like, okay, what can we do right now, really fast, which kind of tools I can use as, as a Ruby developer or DevOps to try to make my application more secure. But there's a lot more things uh, there. So uh, one of my plans is to start to do a blog post series once in a while with what, like one trick, one trick depending on the language. So some things more generic like those or something more specific to the language, to the language or the framework. But there is so many things that we can do right now so our goal, I think, to make our application more secure is really to find what is the quickest path to have the biggest impact. So I saw some of you, I already know that some of you were looking at me at the end of that presentation and say like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Like, okay, I understand, security is important. I'm gonna go back to do my own stuff and don't really care about it. I just, like what you just said for the last 30 minutes. But I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be really like, Boiling. I'm gonna like become Hulk or anything. I'm basically part of the shape, so I'm kind of good. So, no, like be serious about security. Think about it. Uh, think about it because it's it's more than it's the security of your user. It's the data of your user. And if you don't care about other people, think about you. It's it's probably your job. It's probably the company. It's probably your product. It's probably the credibility. And again. If you're lucky, and that's going to happen to probably most of us, you will never have any security issue. But you don't want to wait to know about it, if that's going to happen or no. So what is the expression? Better safe than sorry. So plan for it. Include this in your development life cycle. Think about security. It, it doesn't, you don't need to take like 20% of the budget to say, hey, we're going to be like super secure. No, just use those small tools. Most of them, they're free. Most of them after you install them and bundle audit, five seconds, I know which gem to uh, update. Real not complicated. And you need to do it now. Do it now with the next application you're gonna build. Do it with your uh, legacy application. Install a firewall if you don't have them. Uh, think about the basic tools that I talk about. Think about the more complex. Uh, try to use the automated service or uh, use some, some, you can try Nuno. There's a free trial if you want. You don't even have to pay. So there is a lot of free tools out there. There's a lot of paid tools. There's a lot of open source. Go with what makes sense for you, but do something. And every little step you're going to have or you're going to do 
that's going to be one more step or one more fence in front of a hacker. And trust me, if someone really wants to like defecate your site or just like do whatever they want, they're probably going to be able to do it. Uh, because nothing is 100% safe like or bulletproof. Nothing. Like super, <laughs> Superman is the proof. Like there's kryptonite and I'm so sad for that guy. But uh, like there is no tool that is totally secure. Like even I'm working at Immunio and I, I, I will never tell you that Immunio is going to make your website 100% secure. We're going to help it to make it like as much as we can, but there is nothing 100% secure when it comes to security because there is always something new. There is always someone more brilliant than you. There is always uh, a new update that's going to break something. But the more you do, the more chances you have to make your application more secure. So those are some of resources that were not directly in the slides. Uh, again, I'm going to put this online. And uh, I guess we may have time for questions, they're still, still there, but if you're too shy or you don't want to ask a question or you think about it after, uh, please send me an email. Uh, I'm that kind of guy, I'm still using email in that home. Uh, Parker at Munayo. Uh, Twitter is always a good thing. Facebook if you want, LinkedIn. Uh, there's just Google Plus that I really don't like, but I'm still there. So if there's something, ping me there if you really want to use Google Plus. Uh, go on Munayo, try it if you want. Uh, I'm going to put the slides and the recording out of comfortzone.net. This is my blog. Uh, please don't try to hack it because I'm not, uh, you know, what is the expression? Uh, I don't know in English, but uh, so my uh, website may not be that secure. But uh, I'm going to post things there. So I think that's it.